Hola, ¿qué tal? Bueno. Thank you, Maxi. It's a great pleasure and honor for me to be here. Uh, it's possibly one of the biggest quorums I have had in a, in a seminar, so it's a, it is fantastic. Um, I'm competing for the longest title of any presentation at all in the Institute, so you can see it's a four or five lines. Um, and the justification for why I'm in a math department, well, I, I really do math, so I, I try to prove theorems and, uh, and things like that. But it's, it's the only department that can uh, uh, apart from this institute, to have somebody as uh, spread as myself, so otherwise you are fired from any other department. So, so I will I will talk a little bit about some uh, at the end. I will talk a little bit about some new results about uh, matching learning for complex networks. But the, the real message here is uh, this this part of the hyperferical space and how uh, communication or navigation take place on networks in reality. So the first part is a little bit of Full provocation, so feel uh, uh, provoke if you like. And uh, uh, but by the way, I like very much the the, the lemma of the uh, institute, which is uh, connecting science, understanding complexity. I think, more or less, this is what I try to do as well. So, what is the framework here? I was told that uh, I need to give a little bit of wider uh, kind of introduction because not everybody knows that what networks are and so forth. So. Uh, 
basically we can say that networks are the topological skeleton of complex systems. So if we have here uh, infrastructures, we can represent uh, the, the entities of this uh, infrastructure by nodes, so they could be computers or could be train stations or whatever, and then the relation between them that could be cables connecting computers or, or lines connecting the train stations as the edges of this network. Uh, social group or social networks uh, of any kind, it could be face to face or it could be social networks in which the entities here of the uh, network are, the nodes are represented by people and then you have a lot of different type of relations. It could be friendship, familial types, collaboration, etc., etc. And then if you see, we are going down in the scale, and then we can find here uh, certain kind of ecological networks in which what we really have are that the nodes here are not individual animals, but they are the whole uh, uh, group of species of one typical class. And then they are typically connected by traffic interactions, who is eating who. And then this network, of course, has some directionality because the wolf eat the rabbit and not vice versa. And then we can go back in this, down in the scale, we can have, let's say, an atomical network. So a typical case is uh, uh, brain networks in which you have spatial regions of the brain or functional regions of the brain, or you can have vascular networks and so forth. And then at the very down scale of these complex systems, we have all the intermolecular uh, interactions uh, that typically appear in chemistry or in biology. And uh, many of these uh, networks emerge from experiments in the so-called omics technologies. So you can start from genomics and the, the, the entities there are genes or in proteomics and then you have um, uh, proteins as the nodes and then different kind of interactions. It could be uh, activation of one gene to the other or physical interaction, non-covalent interaction between proteins, uh, the different kind of, uh, of connections. But you can have reaction networks like metabolic networks in which the chemicals are connected by chemical reaction which are activated by enzymes or you can have any other type of molecular interaction. You can even represent a protein as a network. If you consider the interaction, the non-covalent and covalent interaction between uh, the residues of or amino acids in a given protein. So this is the so-called residue networks. So you can see practically you can represent any networked system by using this kind of technology. And then some people are scandalized in some way. I say, okay, but unless you are telling me that almost everything is a network. And I say, well, a network is just a mathematical object. In a similar way as an integral is a mathematical object. And you don't care what you are integrating, and the integral acquires a physical meaning according to what you are integrating. It could be molecular shapes, or it could be an abstract function. So this is exactly the same. There is nothing special about this kind of representation by using what we call a mathematical graph. So a graph is a mathematical object. It's in reality a one-dimensional object because you only need a set of vertices, which is uh, the nodes here represented by the entities of the complex system. And then in reality, the edges, which are the relation between these uh, nodes, came from a subset of the Cartesian product of the set of vertices to itself. So I, I put this very intentionally because when I work with molecules, uh, some chemists uh, raise their hand and say, Ernesto, you are uh, representing the molecule as a two-dimensional object, and the molecule is known to be a three-dimensional object. And I say, I'm sorry to say that I am representing this by a one-dimensional object. So it's even worse than you think. So um, the networks are really of many different kinds. So this is the simplest, and then we call this a simple graph or a simple network. And it's only formed by the vertices and the edges. These edges can possess direction, so it can be no bidirectional. Uh, it can have weights. In reality, let me tell you something. This is a secret. Any square metric, any complex square metric is a graph, full stop. Typically, we use linear algebra to understand graphs. Richard Grualdi, for instance, the, the editor-in-chief of linear algebra and his application, do it the other way around. He used graphs to understand linear algebra. So there is a bijection between the two areas here. 
So, what is in reality the motivation of this specific talk? Well, as a prime mathematician, you always want to show an experiment. So I will show you one experiment that was carried out in 1957, uh, possibly the line with the references. Ah, oh, no, no, okay, so it's, it's okay. So uh, this experiment was carried out by Stanley Milgram, who was an experimental psychologist in, in America, and he's very well known, famous because of another experiment, I can tell you uh, in the coffee or with a beer if you like. But the experiment was really motivated by uh, the speech for the Nobel Prize uh, uh, of Guglielmo Marconi, and he asked the question, what should be the separation between two individuals in the world? But not geographic separation, social separation. If I shake hands with Maxi and Maxi shake hands uh, with Ingo, then my separation to him is two steps. So this is the kind of separation that they were interested. So Milgram was an American uh, psychologist, so you know that Americans believe that the world is just America, so he did the experiment just in America, <laughs> taking about 300 people from the central states of America, Omaha and Wichita, and then the experiment consists in the following. He got a letter to the people and said, this letter has to arrive to somebody, suppose with the name, living in Boston. So the separation the here is about, huh? Which is the center of the world. Yeah, of course. <laughs> and then uh, you have a separation of about 2,000 kilometers, but it doesn't matter here. So you have to give the letter to somebody that you know personally, so, by the first name, as they say. Okay, so what the results of Milgram were? The first and most shocking result is here. So this is a histogram of the number of complete chains to the number of intermediate needed to reach the target person. Well, there were no more than 11 steps for the letters to go from one place to the other, and the peak here is at six. Six degrees of separation. This is the source of this myth of the six degrees of separation. The second result of Milgram, and I am taking draw by his hand in this Psychology Today paper, is the following. He noticed, and during 40 years nobody noticed that, or maybe didn't care of that, that not all the chains were complete. Number of complete chains. There were lost letters. There are letters that still maybe are going around in America. We don't know. Maybe Donald Trump is hiding one of these letters. But he found an a possible explanation for that based on the inbreeding. We call that in mathematics transitivity. Maxi and I am friends. I didn't know Ingo until yesterday, but Ingo is a friend of Maxi. So the chance that we close a triangle by transitivity is higher than expected if these social relations were totally random. So, in other words, we have more triangles, it's not really triangles, but we have more close transitive relations, like triangles, than the ones that we can expect. So, how this can affect this number of chains here? Suppose this is me, and I give the letter to F. The only thing that F knows is that the originator of the letter was me. So he can pass the letter to N. The only thing that N knows is that the originator of the letter was F, because the memory doesn't, didn't keep memory. So he can send me the letter back to me. I'm a busy person. So I will do it a little bit more. I will give to C. C passes to B. B returns the letter to me, and I get bored of the experiment and throw away the letter. So that's a possibility. So there is certain amount of information that can get lost when we try to communicate in this diffusion light way. But now, these degrees of separation has been immediately associated with the mathematical metric that exists since long time in graphs and networks, which is the shortest path distance. So what we can say here in mathematical terms is that for this network, social network in the US in 1967, we don't know, maybe 100 million people, the average shortest path should be maybe about six. I don't believe that, but this is what people believe today. And what is the shortest path? Well, a path is just a sequence 
of different nodes and edges in the graph. And this is very important because there is a confusion, particularly in the physics literature, between path and walk. And I will use both. And in a walk, you can do backtracking, you can do repetition, but not in a path. And we are lucky in English, that's maybe why this is the language of science. In Spanish, it's a little bit different. It's a camino of this type or camino without repetition. But here we have the two, even three, so we have the trials one. So, for instance, if this is the originator of the letter and this is just the target, there are many different paths. There are many of these different sequences that avoid any repetition of the nodes or the edges. But only, in this particular case, only one of them has five steps. So the length of these should be one, two, three, four, and five. So this is the length of this shortest path. And among all the paths, the one with the shortest length is the shortest path. And then we can prove very easily that this is a distance. This is a distance, it fulfill the four axioms of a distance, if the network is undirected. If the network is directed, two of the axioms are not fulfilled. There is no symmetry. It means that going from A to B can take five steps, but going from B to C can take an infinite, or zero, or one steps. So then it means that this is true, this is a distance, only for the case of undirected graphs. And this happens for any metric, for any distance, okay? Now, we have these so-called centrality indices that try to capture how important you are in your network. So this is the closeness centrality, this is the between centrality. I will not take details, but this is based on the inverse of the sum of all the shortest path distances. And this is just the ratio of the shortest path going from R to S and crossing the node I, which I am evaluating here, divided by the total number of shortest path which go from R to S. So then it means that these are centrality for what? Well, these are centrality if the processes which are taking place on the network goes exclusively by the shortest path. Now, here you have who can identify this quantity. This is the network efficiency. And this was put forward by a friend of mine. I discussed this a couple of weeks ago with him, Vito Latora and Macchiori. And this is just the normalized sum of the inverse of all the shortest path distance in the graph. So they call efficiency. Efficiency for what? According to the definition of efficiency in the Oxford English Dictionary, it's the ratio of the work done or energy developed by a machine engine, put here network, they are not very updated in Oxford, to the energy supplied to it, usually expressed as a percentage. So there is a dynamical process taking place over there, which I am in some way or somebody, nature, society, is optimizing. And this is related to this efficiency, because this is energy work done. So this is efficiency for what? Well, only for dynamical process taking place only through the shortest path. So maybe in networks all the communication goes through the shortest path, as people have been believing in network theory for 20 years now, since the paper of Watt and Stroger in 1998. So let me resume here what people believe. The observation is most of real world networks display relatively small average shortest path length. This is a small world phenomenon put forward by Watt and Stroud in 1998. And then we made the inference that items must travel mainly through the shortest path. If you want to see very nice uh, uh, observation that this is not true, just here you have a member of the uh, institute that has fantastic uh, uh, results showing that this is not always the case. But let me show you, if we try to assume this, why we get into troubles. So what are these troubles? Well, the sender of the letter generally don't know what is the structure of the network. And in order to know what is the shortest path, you need to know what is the global map of the network. So that's a little bit problematic. 
let me try to think that Americans in 1967 were rational beings, and they follow a certain kind of rational algorithm. So I have five friends. Max is very well connected. He knows 100 people, and he only knows two people. So to whom I will give the letter, to him or to Maxi? Just to Maxi. Because the chance that the letter is just directed through the shortest path by taking the most connected node will be higher than if you take somebody that only knows me. So the letter will return immediately to me. So what happened then is that I can say, OK, there is a high probability that the shortest path, this is asymptotic, but let me say it like that. But the shortest path connecting two randomly selected nodes, P and Q, goes through the most connected nodes. So suppose that this is the most connected node of this, so it pass the information to this. This analyze the same, do the same, do the same. So this is the shortest path here. And then, bingo. Sending the information to the most connected nodes saves the case. Are we missing something? Maybe transitivity. What happened is that the most connected nodes has the higher chance to get involved in more transitive relations. They take place in more triangles. So if you give the letter to him, the letter can go around this node and get lost. So we have a paradox. Sending the information to the most connected nodes in some way guarantee that the letter goes through the shortest path, but also guarantee that the letter get lost due to the high transitivity of these hubs. So how to solve that paradox? Well, maybe because <coughs> in most of the complex systems, the senders of information, a neuron don't know the trillion neurons in the brain, a member of a social network don't know the whole structure of the social network, and so forth, the items not only flow through the shortest path, but by taking a diffusion-like mechanism in which they use all the available routes that exist in the network. Let me ask you a single question. In a tree, a tree is a network without cycles, we always have a unique shortest path between every pair of nodes. How many of you have seen real world networks which are trees? Or maybe the rivers, apart from that? No. So why there are cycles? Why we have this redundancy? Maybe because we need them to send information not only through the shortest path, but also through other routes that can guarantee that the information arrive into the final destination. So now we, in 2008, uh, with my colleague uh, uh, Naomichi Hatano in Tokyo, and with uh, Rodriguez Velasquez, which is in Tarragona, uh, we define this communicability function that take into account that the communication between two nodes, the communicability between, between these two nodes in a network depends on the total number of routes connecting them. But yeah, we want to give more weight to the shorter routes than to the longer ones. It means that the shortest path will continue to be the most important one. It's the shortest. It's the most economic one. But if it fails in some way, I have alternative routes to go from one place to the other. So I have to define what is a route here. For mathematical convenience, I will use here the definition of a route as a walk. And a walk of length L between the nodes P and Q is just any sequence of not necessarily different nodes and edges. This means that the particle can do backtracking, can go back and forth several times. So it could be repetition of both nodes and edges, starting at this point and ending at this one. And in this particular case, what we have is that the length of this walk is the number of edges involved. OK? So if you do one, two, three, this is a walk of length three between one and two. Now, this is selected for mathematical convenience, because now we can express this communicability between two nodes as a weighted sum of all the walks of any length between P and Q from length equal to zero, which means you stay in the sofa doing nothing or watching the football, to an infinite walk that is wandering around in the network 
an infinite number of steps. But see, if we don't put these coefficients here, these zeros diverge. And we obtain no information at all. So what we really need are these coefficients here that need to fulfill two conditions. I used it to say that. I wanted somebody to say, yes, I'm so I can prove that. It's easy. But so we can say that this made the series converge, and at the same time, that gives more weight to the shorter than to the longer one. Possibly the two conditions are the same. So possibly if you do this, you guarantee that the series converge. And in order to guarantee that the series converge, you need to do that. So, but I want to emphasize both to see the meaning of what we are doing. So why number of walk of L steps? Because we have the adjacent symmetric. Forget about this definition, which is in terms of operators in a Hilbert space. But this is just the adjacent symmetry that they zeros and ones. Ones, if the corresponding two nodes are connected and zero otherwise. And then we have this theorem that was proved by Svekovic in 1967. Let's say that the number of walk of length L between the nodes P and Q in any graph is given by the PQ entry of the Lth power of the adjacent symmetry. So now we can take this and plug in our equation here. And then we need only these coefficients. Suppose that our metric is diagonalizable. So I will have eigenvalues that I will use here in non-increasing order and the corresponding eigenvectors. So I can plug here in our expression. And I will obtain the communicability on the basis of power of, of eigenvalues and the product of eigenvectors. But of course, because after the selection of these coefficients, these zeros will converge, I will have something that we call a mathematics symmetric function. There are many different ways of doing that. This is my preferred one. So I will take the sum of the powers of the JC symmetry divided by the factorial of this length. Why? Well, this converge to the exponential of the adjacent symmetry. And I emphasize to my student, it doesn't mean to take every entry of the metric and rise to the exponential. Because many times, my students in the lab come and say, Ernesto, the communicability metric is just full of ones. Yeah, if it has many zeros, the exponential of zero used to be one. But this is not like that. So you have a definition based on this Taylor series. Also, don't do the calculation by using the Taylor series. There is a paper in the Science Review, which is 19 dubious way of computing the exponential of the metric. So any of these 19 dubious ways of computing the exponential is, is better than taking the exponential. And here you have the expression in terms of the exponential of eigenvalues and the corresponding product of, this is just the j's eigenvector, the entry p, and the j's eigenvector, the entry for the node. So you are physicists. Does this look to something familiar, exponential of an operator? Yes, exactly. So we can have different interpretation of this. Here is my preferred one. And then we published this in a physical report in 2012 with Naomichi and Michele. And here is our idea. OK, you take the network, your real world network, as a network of coupled harmonic oscillators. So here you have these are balls of mass m. They are connected by springs of force constants omega. And here is the trick. We need to tie these nodes to the ground with one spring that has a force constant much bigger than the maximum degree. The mathematical trick here is that if you solve this vibrational problem, it involves the Laplace. It's a Laplace operator, it's the one. So I want to get rid from the diagonal entries of the Laplacian operator, which are related to the degree. So I want that the degree, if I remove them, what I am doing physically is removing the translational movement of the network. That's very, very realistic. My brain is not moving out my school. OK? So in this way, if I solve, this is the Hamiltonian. These are the ladder operators that you know more than I like. Uh, uh, things like that. So the, the vibration in one particular node can be felt by another node, connected or not connected to this particular node. Then we solve that, taking the partition function, etc., etc., and prove that the thermal green function, which tell you how a thermal perturbation and an inverse temperature beta is felt, uh, uh, 
thermal oscillation at the node P is felt by the node Q is given apart from physical constants here by the exponential of the JS symmetric, the corresponding PQ entry. So then it means that this communicability function is telling us how a perturbation at one given node is felt by another node in the network if this perturbation is transmitted not only through the shortest path but by any route. And this is what happened in the real world. You take a network of couple harmonic oscillators. Well, if you are asking yourself what happened if you don't put this in a quantum system, well, you end up to a different system here. You end up with the resolvent of the adjacent symmetry. We solved the two problems here in this paper. So how people have used this kind of ideas in order to compare with the shortest path. We never, well, maybe, maybe in the future, but we now don't have any direct proof that for this system, information is really transmitted through the shortest path or through all routes. Maybe with Ingo we can do something experimentally there. But there are indirect evidence that these can be, in fact, taking place. So the first two papers were this by a group in Strathclay and a group in Oxford. I am not co-author of neither of the two papers, so you can believe me. And they did the following. They took 10 patients that had suffered a stroke six months before the experiment. The stroke was always in one brain hemisphere. And then they compared them with 10 healthy individuals, more or less same age, sex, etc. And they study the flow of water through different regions in the brain by using imaging tractography. So in reality, you have a relatively small network, 56 nodes only, which correspond to 48 cortical regions and eight subcortical regions. But you have direction in the flow, and you have a weight, which is the amount of water flowing from A to B which is not necessarily the same from B to E. And I will go quick, because otherwise I will have no time for the rock and roll. But if you assume that this water is flowing just through the shortest path, you are not able to distinguish some of these points here. Why is this important? This was my first question to them. And they explained, well, we want to use this as a tool for checking whether I have suffer a stroke or not in the past. And say, so, well, if I suffer a stroke, I will know. No, necessarily. You are getting older, not you, me. I'm getting older, and I am missing abilities. So in the past, I danced a lot now. And then I say, this is because I am getting older. But maybe this is a consequence of one stroke that I have suffered, which is very small, and I have not detected. So if you go to your doctor and you say, could you please use this sophisticated technique tell me whether I have a stroke or not. If you are in this situation, the doctor can't tell you nothing. What is, what is the ah, yeah. So this is the second largest uh, singular vector of the uh, uh, metric. In reality here, you have patients versus the communicability between different pairs of regions. So you have a rectangular, long rectangular metric. And the simplest way of obtaining a partition into two is by taking the fibular vector, which is the, the eigenvector corresponding to the second uh, to the second largest eigenvalue of the singular value of the composition of this metric. It's just one technique, so you can use any other technique. But by using exactly the same technique, but assuming that the water is flowing in a diffusive way, so they were able to distinguish between the two groups. And more important than that is that they took the average of all the matrices for the stroke patient and the average of the matrices for all the healthy uh, uh, patients or people. So you have an average stroke and an average healthy person, and they took the difference between the two. So here you see this is the average of all the strokes. Nobody can have a stroke of this size, otherwise die. And then these are regions in which communicability decrease. And then you can see a lot of decreasing communicability around the stroke, but also in the other hemisphere. This is uh, from uh, lateral front and from the top. But there are some good news. There are regions that increase communicability, possibly in compensation to the damage. 
So here you have increasing communicability at different regions. And they were able in the second paper to make exactly the same classification by using information from the healthy brain hemisphere. So, well, this is something. There are many other papers. I will go very quickly. I have found about 50 papers that use communicability and compare with the shortest path. And then people conclude that global communicability form an extension to other um, measures displaying significantly higher values, blah, blah, blah. I am not co-author of this paper. Uh, again, cancer therapeutic response can be partially predicted on the basis of a network communicability measure, blah, 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 blah. I am not co-author of this paper. Again, here, people identify uh, common cancer genes. Here is uh, early relapse in remitting multiple sclerosis. Uh, this is very funny. This is uh, autonomous cars, and then they are trying to perform one particular task. And this is the success rate. The best that they can do is about 40%, so don't drive these kind of cars. But uh, this is just the, something they developed from the uh, uh, communicability they call G-rank, so sort of like a page rank or something like that. These are the uh, degree closeness between us, eigenvector centrality, which take into account that the information flow through only the shortest path. So there are many examples. This is one of the coolest ones is in bioinformatics. And so here you have uh, mean shortest path and mean communicability for uh, networks representing genetic diseases. Here there is no difference whatsoever between the two groups. Here you see significant difference for all the groups, particularly for neurological diseases. And then they conclude that network communicability provide advances over alternative metric because blah, 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 blah. So the idea is that you are adding more information. But you are in some way assuming here that information is flowing not through the shortest path, but by using all the routes. Well, you can continue. So this is uh, granular material. You apply a strain force, and the material cracks. They check many different things, clustering coefficient, etc. But they show that the communicability function gives you more information. This is the last one, communicability and financial crisis. Of course, this is a posteriori analysis. Uh, everybody can predict the crisis of the 2008. That was very visible. But this one, in the first quarter of 2010, is not, according to these authors, visible if you use shortest path information propagation. And what is this related to? This is indicative of revelation concerning the financial situation in Greece and it actually debated first bailout, bail, bailout. And this is visible in network communicability, but not in other kind of measures. So let me conclude here, and let me be modest. In many real world processes on network, communicability is more explicative than shortest path. Okay? So, what we can infer there, that items may travel, may travel in a diffusion like way through the nodes and edges of networks, and in this way they are taking all the potential routes that go from one place to the other. Now, we have been a little bit unfair with the communicability. Shortest path is a distance. Communicability is not. It's very easy to show that it doesn't fulfill triangle inequality. So now the point is whether this communicability generates or not a geometry in the network. And then the idea here is that communicability gives the capacity of the network to transport information between two nodes, but not the quality of this communication. If you came from a country in which the president or prime minister speak for six hours, you can, you can imagine that not necessarily all the information is captured by people. And most of this information is returned to the speaker. So then we can consider that in a communication, what we want to minimize is the information that gets lost in this process. And we try to maximize the information which is really transmitted from the originator to the target. So we know that this self-communicability, the diagonal entries of the exponential, account for the information that depart from the nodes P, wander around the network, but returns to the node P. What happened to Milgram experiment? Sometimes the letter 
go back to the originator of the letter due to transitivity. Not necessarily triangles. It could be squares, it could be pentagons, etc., etc. And then we have this quantity that take into account the amount of information that depart from the node P, wanders around the network and, reach, and, and end up in the node K. So in reality, we have information that we can call lost because it returned to the point, and information that is successfully transmitted. So there are two ways of trying to quantify this difference or the ratio of these two magnitudes. So let's me put the simplest one, which is the difference between the amount of information that depart from the node P and return to the node P, the same for the node Q, minus twice, because the network need to be symmetrized, the number or the amount of information departing from P and arriving to Q or the other way around. And you will see immediately why we need to symmetrize that system. Well, if this quantity, call it as you want, is small, it means that the amount of information which is lost is relatively small, and the amount of information which is transferred is relatively large. If this quantity is very large, it's because this is small and this is very large. Now, there are some good news. You can prove, and any student in this classroom can do it. This is kindergarten linear algebra in Spain or in continental Europe and uh, postgraduate linear algebra in the UK. <laughs> we prove that this is a Euclidean distance between the corresponding nodes. So it's not only a distance, it's Euclidean. If I ask you what kind of embedding induced the shortest path distance, nobody knows. Neither you nor I, not any mathematician. So now I can compare, in a fair way, the shortest path and the communicability in a given network. And I will just do this comparison for this funny small network, two houses in a city. And I will assume that you are not so drunk that if you use this street, you will return the same street back. So at least you need two or three more pints for that. So if you go to this node, you are not returning. You go one of the other way. So what we have here is that we have the shortest path between P and Q is this path that has one, two, and three. So now, in the network, I cannot send information outside the edges, okay? Because the space, the whole space is the graph. So I have to send information from this node to this, from this node to this, and from this node to this. So how to quantify the communicability in this path? Let's call this the communicability path. Well, I will take the sum of all the distance for all the pairs of nodes which are both connected and in the path one. So I will take the communicability distance of this plus this plus this, and this gives me this number. Now I have this other path, which is a longer path. It has four steps. It's not the shortest path. And I do the same, and I obtain this smaller number. So. The shortest path is this one. The shortest communicability path is this one. So this is telling me that sending the information through the shortest, sorry, through the path number two is shorter than sending the information through the shortest path. Why? Any guess? Because you don't know the structure of the graph. You are relatively drunk. You are right here. OK, I will not return, but I have one third probability of going into any of these three nodes. So I'm coming here. I will not return, but I have one half and one half. So I will go here. I will not return, but I will have one half and one half. So I will end up in my origin. So if you do the simulation, sometime, yes, it will go by three. Sometime will go by four. Sometime will go by five. Sometime will go by six. Sometime by seven. So if you take the average, this is much bigger than the four that you all will, will obtain here. We go here, not returning, only one, only one, only one. Every time I do the simulation, I will end up in just four steps. So, but here is something interesting. Remember when we formulate the hypothesis, we say that the shortest path with high probability cross the halves of the network. And in our definition, the halves are characterized by GPP and GQQ. 
So what is happening here is that the particle is taking the shortest path that the boy the hops. But not the hops in terms of degree, the hops in terms of leakishness. Because we are taking GPP, take GPP, take into account all the returnability around this particular node. Okay. Here is for one student that likes to do games. What is it? Good. So here is a planar graph. It could be a city. I have to say that Mason uh, is here and he has made a, a work in which we have done analysis of traffic in real cities with real data. And we showed that most of traffic goes not through the shortest path in at least four cities across the world, but across the shortest communicability path. But now, this is the point. You want to go from this point to this point, and here you have the shortest Euclidean distance. What this means? Well, if you take the sum of the geographic distance between all these streets, this is the shortest one. Forget about that. This is the shortest path. The nodes here are drawn with radius proportional to the clickishness. Okay? So, see, very central nodes are very central nodes. And this is the shortest communicability distance. No one of these nodes is a hub in terms of clickishness in the network. So this has many implications, okay? I was illuminated today by a talk. So think that this is pressure. If you think that this is pressure and this is just one stream, this stream is try to avoid the high pressure centers in that particular system. But now, I will put the game here in the following way. Suppose that you want to go from two randomly selected points, or from one randomly selected point to another. But you want to avoid these points that has a very large number of intersections. Maybe because you are hiding something. Or maybe you are. And in these hubs, there is more chance to be police controls. So if the police is going to control some places, here it has more probability to find people. OK, so you want to try to avoid this. But if you go by a very long detour, the probability of getting sanctioned also increase because it's additive. So you want to try to avoid the hops, but not to increase very much the length of this path. So my challenge is, is that the communicability path, so if you do the simulations with this kind of system, do you end up with the shortest communicability distance, and this is open. The other way to do that is how much time I have? No. Wow. OK, so the other way you can do is just taking the ratio of the communicability between the two nodes. OK, you have GPQ and GQP, but this is exactly the same. So you will have GPQ squared divided by uh, the product of these two guys. And then you take the square root of everything, and you obtain this. So this is the other way of quantifying that. And the good news is that this function is the cosine of the angle spanned by the position vectors for the nose P and Q in certain Euclidean space. Certain Euclidean space. That's the proof. Very simple. What is this space? Well, this is not kindergarten linear algebra. So this space is Euclidean sphere of dimension n, in which n is the number of nodes. The radius is given by this. And the nodes will be placed at the surface of the sphere. The communicability distance would be the core connecting the two nodes. And the communicability angle would be the angle between the position vectors in this space. In linear algebra, they call this matrix a circle Euclidean. And here you have for the one that we can visualize. So we have three nodes here. That's the origin of the coordinate systems. These are the three eigenvectors. The position vectors depends on the eigenvalues and the uh, roads of the metric, the orthogonal metric of eigenvectors of the adjacency metric. 
These are the position vectors, which are given here by these values. This is the communicability distance. In small graphs, you will have that the geodesic and the communicability distance are different. As soon as you increase the size of the system, the two are the same because the curvature is too high. So there is no meaning at all for complex networks to study the geodesic. I did the calculation and they are exactly the same. So here you have that now the magnitude of these position vectors are given by the self-communicability, communicability angles, and so forth. And now you can express this as an inner problem, so it's a grand metric, the communicability metric is a grand metric, and so forth. Now, how to visualize these networks, okay? Well, it depends. If you are a mathematician, you immediately can visualize a 100-dimensional space. <laughs> how you do it? It's two steps. First, you visualize an n-dimensional space, and then you replace n equal to 100. <laughs> But now, if you want to really visualize that, you can do dimensionality reduction. And what I am talking here is about very simple ideas. And in reality, I have to be honest with you, what I want is just to visualize this. So I contacted a girl, a lady, that is very good in programming, Maria Pereira, you know her. And then we want to say multidimensional scaling, non-metric multidimensional scaling, in which we have this n-dimensional space represented by the communicability angles. Why? because the distance is not bounded. But the communicability angle is bounded between 0 and 90. So for a simple graph, this quantity is bounded between 0 degrees and 90 degrees. 0 degrees means that the quality of communication is the best. And if they are perpendicular, it means that they are not communicating at all. OK? So then what we want to do is to reproduce this metric, but in three dimensions, trying to keep as much as possible the magnitude of the angles. Okay? Well, here you have Erdos Rengi and Barabachi Alder graphs. You see that when you reduce, the nodes are not in the surface, they are just inside the ball. You possibly don't know these two graphs. These are the random planar analogous of the Erdos Rengi. So these graphs are random, but they are planar. And look at this. This is almost a perfect sphere. This is almost a perfect sphere. First question, not solved. We note that the sphere and the plane are locally homeomorphic. So do this means that planar graphs are embedded when you reduce the space into a perfect sphere? Can I use the standard deviation or any other measure of the sphericity of the embedding as a measurement of planarity? See, detecting planarity is NP complete. So, because you need to detect what is the maximum planar subgraph and then taking the relation of the number of edges in this subgraph to the total number of edges in the graph. But this is an open question. Now, I wanted to visualize things. This is a network of a karate club in America. It's very famous or infamous or whatever. And what happened is that this guy and this guy that were the administrator and the trainer of the karate club had an argument and the network was polarized, experimentally polarized. I mean, the, 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 the sociologists were interviewing people and say, OK, are you a follower of one or are you a follower of 34? And people replied to that. So we have this network. And I want to visualize many networks, but why? visualize this network and made the reduction to the 3D, I saw that the blue nodes are in one side and the red nodes are in the other side. Maybe it's a coincidence. This is a network of dolphins playing um, around uh, a bottle noose uh, dolphins playing around uh, the coast of New Zealand. And there are two communities that were formed because one of the dolphins disappeared from the group. And then they polarized and now they are these ones are playing more frequently together, and these are playing more frequently together, but not playing very much between them. Hmm. It looks like uh, there is a separation exactly of the two groups. See that there is one group which is bigger than the other. So this is uh, a network that was studied by Newman. These are the uh, football clubs, American football clubs, and how they play in the division 
IA, which I don't know what is these colleges. And here is, again, and here, well, there are more examples. You see that there is a natural separation of the cliques, of the clusters. So we say, why not to do cluster analysis? And this is the last of my talk. So we simply do for these five networks for which there are ground truth. So we know that there are these communities over there. Uh, this is just the famous uh, uh, Newman modularity that for our method has nothing to say because our method is not based on density, but it's based on the amount of flow of information inside the communities and outside them. And here we use it, uh, three different, in reality, were four different uh, quality uh, validation methods in order to see how our method is performing. So the maximum that you can have here is one, and the minimum is zero. So in our case, for uh, most of these networks, for all of these networks, we have an average of 0.83 by using the silhouette, and more or less the same here. This method is known to fail because it goes and, and try to split the, 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 the graph into more and more and more communities. And this is what happened here, but in general, don't give very good results. And these are for exactly the same five networks, the best known methods that you have for detecting clusters or communities. Low vein, which is uh, optimization of the Newman modularity, fast greedy, InfoMap, eigenvector, LP. As average, they are in about 0.6. So we are not doing very badly at all. So at least for these networks that we know that exist uh, a ground truth, our method is producing uh, a little bit better results than the classical ones. And this is just to show one potential application here. So here you have diseases, genetic diseases, and the genes that has been identified to participate in these diseases. So if this gene is participating in ovarian cancer, so they are connected. So it means that I can make two projections, a projection in the disease-disease space or a projection in the gene-gene space. So here I have the nodes are genes and two genes are connected if and only if they co-participate in the same disease. Okay? So I will study this network. I will use my approach. This is the, how the network looks like. And there are 22 different diseases. Well, I know this. I don't, I don't want to reproduce this. I don't really want to reproduce that. I want to discover things. And in order to discover things, what I want to see is that there are groups of diseases for which the genes co-participate. And then we found A genes. So for instance, in this cluster here, 37% of the genes are involved in cancer. And curiously enough, 29% are participating in neurological diseases. So there are some clusters in which they are totally dominated by, for instance, hematological diseases. But then uh, we focus on this uh, particular cluster, and we put the hypothesis that genes involved in neurological disorder, which are in cluster one, can also be involved in cancer. Now, I don't have a wet lab. And I am not a rich man in order to do that. So how can we verify our hypothesis? Well, this network was created and published by Baravacci and his team in 2007. So let me now collect here a few genes that were involved in neurological diseases, but up to 20, 2007, were totally unknown to participate also in cancer. And then I searched the literature from 2008 up to now and see whether there are sufficient reports that they are also involved in cancer. These are not the total genes. There were 25. So from 25 genes, 19 genes were co-participating in both diseases. So. It is possible that the other six genes are also co-participating, but has not been discovered, or is part of the genes that don't co-participate. But what is important is that this can illuminate biologists about possible relation of genes and diseases. We did the same for another group of uh, uh, diseases, but this is too much for one day. So thank you very much, and I appreciate very much your attention. Thank you.
Thank you very much, uh, Ernesto. You now get the time for questions. There are three. You have uh, proposed a particular form of the commun communicability, which is weighting the, the, pa the parts with one other factorial of yes. the length. What happens if you change this? But yeah, I mean, that's, that's yesterday you talked about different uh, so depend, can with, with exponentials, with the Moolean power laws, and does yeah. it change? So apparently there are many ways of doing that, but in reality they are not. So for instance, you need you want to use all the powers of the adjacent symmetric weighted by a given weight and in such a way that all the weights are positive. So then immediately exclude cosine of A, sine of A, hyperbolic sine of A, hyperbolic cosine of A. All the trigonometric and hyperbolic trigonometric are not usable. This depends only on odd powers. This depends only on even powers. This depends on e even and odd powers but with different signs. So they are not what we are looking for. But then you can do something like you take the sum of uh, alpha power k a to the k from k equal to 0 to infinity. And now alpha is a parameter. First thing, you have a parameter. I don't like parameters. This parameter is bounded between 0 and the inverse of the largest eigenvalue of the JSON symmetry. This converge, and this converge to i minus alpha a minus 1. So this is the resolvent of the JSON symmetric. But then you have the parameter alpha. Now what happened with the parameter alpha, this is a collaboration as well with Mason. We have to study this. And then for real world networks, lambda 1 is very large. So this is bounded between 0 and 0 0.0001. So you have a very small range in which the contribution of this is very small, and this quantity is very, very close to the degree. So you are penalizing so heavily the uh, longer walks that they practically are not contributing. The shortest walks that you can con uh, uh, consider here are the length two, which is equal to the degree. So recently, and also looking for these kind of things, we took this in which this is the double factorial. It's not the factorial of the factorial, so are the even factorials of the uh, corresponding quantity. Uh, this converge, and it converges to a combination of the error function of a metric and the exponential of the square of the metric. So it's very complicated. You can make an approximation by the hyperbolic tangent as well, but when you try to apply these kind of things, what you observe is that in some way they are highly correlated to the exponential. So you of course can do, we have published uh, this paper in the science review with Haim, in which we define a series of uh, metric functions uh, for the adjacent symmetric. And then I published this journal of theoretical biology, in which I compare for the identification of essential proteins, for instance, uh, by using other uh, methods. You can improve a little bit, you can go, but in general is too much complication for gaining too little information. So far so good. So, but yes. Yes. The communicability concept is a very interesting one and you showed uh, some practical examples. And just to take one example out of that, for example, the traffic uh, system that you, that you showed, every link usually has more than one quality. It has, for example, a capacity and it has a latency, for example, associated with it. Yeah. Why do you think uh, that it's uh, worked applying it to, uh, to these examples? Or do you think that you also formally can extend uh, your concept of communicability to, to these kind of uh, situations? Yeah. So that's typically, that's a very good question. So uh, typically, you can arrive to the same function from many different areas, OK? Uh, if you are a physicist, you know that the Hamiltonian of a tight binding uh, system is just equal to minus the JSON symmetry. So then the, the, the partition function of the system is directly related to this quantity I have. But also, there is another way in which, and I will connect to yesterday talk, you have here uh, the diffusion process 
uh, which I have the states of the nodes which are diffusing over there. This is the uh, network Laplacian operator. And then I have here uh, this initial condition. OK, so the solution for that is just the exponential of minus t times L and the initial condition. OK, so we know that L here is just a diagonal metric of degrees minus the JSN symmetric. So this is exactly equal to the exponential of minus t k plus uh, t a. Use it. OK? So now what happened? That in many situations, this diffusion is not the real thing that is happening there. Because in this particular case, the waiting time of the random walker at every node is proportional to the degree. So the only time that it takes at intersections is just to flip in a coin to see to which of the ways it will go. Now, in a traffic situation, what happened at rush hour in particular is that you have to wait because there is a queue, there is a traffic light, or there is congestion. So now suppose that there is a waiting time tau, which is very big. Okay. So then this can be approximately equal to the exponential of minus t tau. Well, remember that these two matrices doesn't commute. And for the students, if you have m plus q, is different from e to the m times e to the q. OK? So these two matrices, this happens only if the matrices p and q commute. So I cannot extract communicability from this case. But now if I have this t uh, tau much bigger than the degree of the node, so we have that uh, typically the waiting time is equal to uh, dimensional constants here times the degree. And what I am saying now is that tau is equal to this c multiplied by the maximum degree in which c is much bigger than 1. So then, this is just the identity metric. And this, of course, commute with e to t a u 0. Of course, this is just a constant. And then you recover the communicability from here. So the communicability can also be explained from a diffusion process in which there is waiting time. In a graph, what you really are doing is adding a loop weighted by the weight tau. So it's like, and then if, if you think about the brain, so if you consider diffusion, it means that the information enters the neuron and immediately goes. Then what, what, what we have neurons? They have to process information. So they have to enter the neuron, do something in a given time, and then going out. And then what we have done, empirically at least, is for the traffic, we compare this term with this term. And we observe that most of the traffic go by the shortest communicability path, but not by the shortest diffusion path. So this is not very much different than the shortest path. That's a very good point. OK, Ernesto, I think we, we run out of time. But yeah. I, but um, perhaps you could tell us briefly where was the machine learning part. <laughs> Well, the machine learning is the techniques that we use in order to extract these clusters. So clustering and multidimensional uh, scaling and things like that. So in reality, what we were doing is just using the worst machine learning techniques that you can find. So k-nearest neighbors and things like that. So now with uh, Russian collaborators, we are trying to use uh, more sophisticated techniques. But in reality, if you use a very sophisticated techniques, you didn't know whether the information that you are extracting is because of the embedding or because of the techniques that you are using. But yeah, it's, call it a justification for talking about distances. <laughs> OK, uh, Ernesto is going to be here this afternoon and tomorrow morning. Will you be here? Or no, no. no. I, well, if uh, uh, anyone wants urgently to talk with uh, him this afternoon, and the host of this organizing this. So let's uh, thank Ernesto again. <laughs>
Sí, nosotros somos, yo soy afro latinoamericano. No, no, pero ellos en, en, en inglés, en, sí, pero en inglés se llaman Americans. En, cuando lo traduce sale. Ya no, pero en Inglaterra le llaman sí, eh, Americans. Sí, sí, claro, sí, 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 claro, claro. ¿Y cuál es el segundo? Y luego lo que el paseo en el Ah, el paseo es el acto, el paseo es el acto de pasear. Sí, seguramente. Hay, en, en inglés hay tres, hay tres conceptos. Hay tres conceptos. Está el, el path, el trail y el walk. Ah, seguramente. seguramente. Gracias. Yo welcome. I, I don't know. I have I have still a few meetings, so I still have a few meetings with a few people. Yeah. <laughs> I think I took everything. Uh, typical. <laughs>